the next episode of archetype analysis had to be put on hold because we have another archetype rematch volume ready volume 5 and yep we already have two uh, three cards in the volume 6 compilation folder so yeah 60 more new cards and in lots of meta relevant archetypes actually got some new support here and some very few and far between cards which I rather uh, not see on this uh, segment again but anyway let's start off with a singular new support for the Malefic archetype that being Malefic Paradigm Dragon this is by far the b best Malefic monster we have ever gotten as its special summoning condition yeah it's essentially you have to banish Malefic Paradox Dragon which is already a malefic card by itself, but this is the malefic version of a malefic monster. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, you can also banish any other ma uh, extra deck malefic monster if the archetype ever gets any in the future. Also, the, the its recovery effect is actually pretty unique since it allows you to basically uh, get a level 8 synchro monster back into the extra deck and then special summon it to the field. Which, in most cases, I imagine is going to be Stardust Dragon because that's the only level 8 uh, Synchro monster that uh, Malefics can put into the Banish Zone consistently. But it also helps if you actually manage to put something else in there. For example, Cyframe Lord Omega. Because, yeah, that would be something, right? Anyway, this is the this is the best monster in the archetype at the cost of, uh, as well, requiring Malefic World to be on the field which is not a bad card by all means but it, uh, it requires a very specific field spell as in all the other uh, non-paradox dragon uh, Malefic monsters only requiring any field spell in order to live so yeah uh, I would definitely run two or three of these and now we move on to the next archetype which received f uh, support which are Infernities and we start off with what was considered one of the worst monsters of all time like anime, manga, uh, and the real game <laughs> yeah this was a manga exclusive for a long time that being Infernity Pawn it's a level 1 monster which uh, if you have no cards in your hand during your draw phase allows you to either place an Infernity card from the uh, from your deck on the top of your deck or set a Void spell or trap card directly from your deck. Okay, so the first effect is as close as this thing comes to being its actual manga effect while during the draw phase if you have no cards in your hand you cannot draw, like period. And this is why the card was considered the worst card ever because you need to draw. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you can get rid of that card in some form or fashion. You know, the real life Infernities absolutely have no problems in getting rid of the card you drew. But anyway, yeah, the first effect is essentially as close as you can get to uh, to that effect in the game. And the only card that benefits from the first effect is Infernity Archfiend, which is not surprising at all while the second effect is slightly more better if it wasn't for the fact that there are barely any targets for this thing if, uh, to go off since there are only two void cards in the game two that support uh, infernities that is one of which you know from the review and the other is a new support the card they received in this compilation unless you're planning on making the, uh, some goddamn bizarre infernity infernoid build I'd say you avoid this one. Next up is uh, Infernity Sage, which you, it was meant to uh, to be ran at at least two copies because its effects are actually pretty dang decent. It allows you to once per turn discard your entire hand during your main phase, and if and if if he himself is uh, discarded to the to the graveyard while you have no cards in your hand, and yeah, you you can basically uh, enact a foolish burial play, which is, is something Infernities appreciate, since th there are lots of good graveyard targets for this thing to send. So yeah, uh, it was meant to synergize with itself with additional copies of itself. Although if you choose to run one, I don't blame you, since Infernities usually have no need to resort to d d measures this drastic in order to get rid of their hand. And now we have move on to the Infernity Wildcat, which is a very nice special summonable tuner monster, which 
who is meant to uh, conjunct, uh, conjunct well with their new uh, uh, new level 3 monster, that is the non-tuner Infernity Conjurer. And the attack decrease on the opponent's monsters is, is kind of irrelevant, but the graveyard resummon effect, if you have no cards in your hand, is uh, in insanely worth it. So yeah, it's a great card, uh, and even backed, by, um, backed up by their new Synchro Monster, Infernity Hell Archfiend, which two, uh, these two were clearly made to summon. A generic rank 6, which has the uh, Hot Red Dragon Archfiend Abyss uh, negation effect, and if you happen to have no cards in the hand, it also destroys the card in question. And not to mention that if it is used as a Synchro material for a Dark Synchro Monster, that... Uh, and that monster has the permanent effect to make two attacks during each battle phase. Holy Jesus, uh, this is bound to get uh, some s uh, sort of uh, power creep soon in form of a, a ban list hit or something because there are lots of Dark Synchro monsters which, uh, can, which would love to have an effect like this, such as Bills of the Diabolic Dragons, Void Ogre Dragon, Infernity Doom Dragon, with some to name, uh, to first name the... Uh, archetypal cards, then uh, Bilzius. There are lots of things uh, you, you can do with this thing, and all, of course the RDA lineup. This is one hell of a Synchro Monster, one hell of an Archfiend, so always run at least two of these in your Infernities. And since this thing has a, such a generic summoning condition, and uh, not uh, not a whole lot of uh, exclusive effects regarding to and having no cards in your hand. You can pretty much run this in any deck that would benefit from it, which is uh, which I'm certainly sure that it, there will be a lot of those. And now uh, we have Infernity Paranoia, which basically turns Infernities into Lone Fire Blossoms, and it also has some graveyard recycling on the side, which is very decent. So I'd recommend running one or two of these. And now we have the final spell card, Contract with the Void, one of their new Void cards. And if you have three, or, uh, three other cards in your hand, you can discard your entire hand to special summon an Infernity Monster or a level 8, or, uh, a level eight Dark Dragon Synchro Monster from your graveyard, which is a very well welcome choice since you can re both revive Doom Dragon and Void Ogre Dragon. At the end, of course, you can discard your hand if you happen to... Uh, don't like what you have and can get rid of it uh, by other means. So yeah, this is a nice card, worth running l just like Into the Void. And now Infernity Suppression is a nice uh, card which can negate some monster effects with some neat burn damage on the side, searchable by uh, Archfiend as well. So you can't go wrong with one or two of these. And now we move on to the archetype which adamantly refuses to absolutely stay dead. Blue Eyes are once again back on the Archetype rematch, and I'm gonna be very honest with you, I am getting very sick of this Archetype, and I pray to God that I won't have to ever read another Blue Eyes effect ever again, because honestly I feel like I'm going to vomit if I see it again in the new Archetype rematch volume, which is still long away. Well, the new cards in question, well, we only have three cards to work with, which is not much, but still too much for uh, for a blue eyes support wave. But this, uh, this, these three cards are actually meant to support Dark Magician as well. So, and also Black Luster Soldier. So it's not that bad, I guess. Strength and Unity is something I would consider mildly okay if it wasn't for the fact that Black Luster Soldiers can't even search it out since this is the card that mostly benefits the Black Luster Soldier archetype, and the only archetype that, that can consi consistently search it is Dark Magician, while well, Blue Eyes players can't uh, search this thing at all. Uh, or so I think. I don't think if Bingo Machine Gogo -Go can search this thing, although Bingo Machine Gogo -Go is still not worth running in the Blue Eyes build, no matter uh, how, uh, how, how much of a uh, how, how much of a wide range it may, might search, but random choice is one of the worst things that you can uh, slap onto a card like that with arc, uh, in an archetype that barely has any other search options, so... Run if you really think you can pull it off, only in Black Luster Soldier builds, which are still not uh, built on ritual summoning since, yeah, this is... This is what I would call the worst card of the bunch, closely followed by the next card, which is Successor Soul, which I'm not sure what was uh, what was supposed to 
happen here, but it certainly ain't something that can help Blue Eyes. This is this was designed to support the Neospatian bunch of cards from the Elemental Hero archetype, not Blue Eyes or Dark Magician. So yeah, no idea what this is supposed to be. So let's just move on to the what I would consider the best card, Destined Rivals. Which, if you control a Blue Eyes White Dragon or a Dark Magician, you can negate the effects of all face-up monsters your opponent currently controls until the end of this turn. And this is a fantastic card for Dark Magicians because, again, Blue Eyes players have no consistent way of getting to this thing. And it's only a win more card for... which is bound to m mess up the, in the already bad consistency of Blue Eyes decks, so... Splashing this thing is going to do them, do, do, do them more harm than good. While Dark Magicians might have some niche uses with them, although they already have a bunch of uh, monster effect negation tools already at, this, at their disposal, so I'm not sure if this is even worth it, even in the Dark Magician build. And that was it for this support wave for, the, for Blue Eyes and partially Dark Magicians, so... I pray to God I no longer have to worry about them getting onto this show, part of the show anymore. Anyway, next up we have Wind Witches, which also got some new support. First of which we have Wind Witch Freeze Bell, which is a nice special summonable uh, ext uh, extension tool for your synchro plays or your link plays. And not to mention it has a nice level changing effect, although I wish it was a tuner monster, because uh, an effect like this on a non-tuner is... Not the most ideal thing, but it's still very much worth it. And also, it pr protects the wind monster, wind synchro monster that used this card as material to be the, uh, from being destroyed by battle, which is a nice plus. And yeah, why am I complaining that this is not a tuner? Well, we all actually got a tuner monster in this support wave in the form of Wind Witch Blizzard Bell, which is not something I would consider a plus since it's a level five tuner monster which can be summoned with no tributes if you if you only control wind witch monsters, which is Genex Furnace levels of ap applicability here. But and also burn damage because yeah that's what wind witches are known for. But on an effect l like this, it's hardly worth it. However, their new synchro monster wind witch diamond bell is so worth it because. Uh, dealing burn damage on summon, uh, depending on a monster level, of course, is uh, absolutely lovely. And if you happen to summon it with, uh, only Wind Witch monster, it can pop two cards on the field when uh, when it, uh, when battle or effect damage is taken. So yeah, and not to mention that yeah, you can use this effect multiple times, so you can basically pop two cards on the field each turn, which is not something to scoff at, especially on a level 8 synchro monster, so yeah. Wind Witch Diamond Bell is the new definitive boss monster of the Wind Witch archetype. Chime of the Wind Witch, not gonna say much except run 3. Same goes for Icewind's Refrain, although you can ease up on that one a bit since uh, it's basically a trap version of a monster reborn, but it also comes with a nice uh, uh, Omni Negate uh, for, uh, for, an, uh, for a response of a Wind Witch monster's effect, so... Yeah, it's a decent counter-ish card, which you can experiment with the ratios. Uh, so yeah, r run any number of these. And now let's move on to the Phantom Knight support card, the one and only Phantom Knight support card. Although Raider's Knight, which is the card in question, also supports Raid Raptors as well. And good riddance, because this thing is not something to put in a Phantom Knight's deck, since it's a uh, waste of an extra deck slot in an archetype that barely goes into higher rank monsters since the, uh, on the only one among them is uh, the Dark Requiem Xyz Dragon which is, uh, has its own summoning caveats. Now this thing is basically a savior and the uh, Raid Raptor build since it basically makes summoning some of their higher ranking monsters immensely easier without using ma rank up magics and with the existence of this some of the rank up magics have effectively be been given the axe since you no longer need to run a certain number of them or uh, run them at all with the existence of this thing's uh, non uh, rank up magic rank up effect so yeah great card but only in a raid raptor build now for one card uh, for uh, one archetype i 
honestly did not expect to see support for. Hands got some new support, and yeah, that is, that is in the form of Thunder Hand. Eh, it's fine. It does its job reasonably well, although I am quite bothered quite a bit that it only works on main deck monsters and prominence hand cannot be special summoned if you control it and yeah that is my most uh, my, the biggest gripe I have with this card but other than that it plays into the uh, handy haha <laughs> hand gimmick so yeah you can run one or two of these just to ensure you have enough hands on standby Next up we have a new Constellar card, again uh, one card worth of support, and that is Constellar Cadesius. Constellar Cadesius is something I would call a one card wonder for the Arctep because it uh, some simply do, does uh, a lot of things. It allows it, uh, it allows it to be special summoned if you control a Constellar monster other than Cadesius, and it uh, and searches a Constellar spell or trap during the main phase, which is uh, uh, again uh, a once per turn for no cost search anything of the back row and not to mention that it gives a nice uh, battle uh, battle effect to an Xyz monster that uh, used this uh, card as material so yeah uh, Constellar has got a hell, a hell of a boost with this since this thing can also be used for other extensions such as like, Link plays even Synchros if you feel like it although with the existence of Constell Constellar Cows that's pretty much not a viable strategy Anyway, that was it for Constellars, and the next archetype that got support, one card worth of support, are Harpy Ladies. They got a level 8 Synchro Monster of all things, Harpy Lady Scratch Clash. It's a generic Synchro Monster, and it has a very nice and applicable summoning condition, as you, you can t uh, treat one Harpy Lady monster, you, Harpy monster you control as a Tuner Monster, which is very good, s considering the fact that Harpy Ladies do not have any tuner monsters of their own and also it's treated as harpy lady while on the field and you can uh, bounce back a card uh, a monster your opponent controls or a harpy monster you control upon an, uh, the opponent uh, or you activating a spell or trap card which is actually very nice plays into the divine wind variant build so yeah Scratch Clash is a, a nice a Synchro monster to run as, as either a Harpy card or a Divine Wind variant uh, extra deck option. And now, you know, yeah, a lot of these uh, archetypes that are following only have one card worth of support. And the next up on the line is Jinzo with Psychic Wave, which is a quick play uh, graveyard setup card and a recycling card with 600 burn damage to top it off. And yeah, it's all right, not exactly what I would consider the optimal amount of consistency and graveyard setup boosting the archetype needed, but it can be uh, it can be uh, used in a pinch. It al also applies if you control any machine monster, not only Jinzo monsters. So yeah, uh, run by preference, I would say honestly. Next up we have the Rose Dragon Archetype, which only received, again, one card worth of support, and that is the level 3 tuner monster, Rose Girl. And this is an excellent extender for all plant-type decks. Not only the Rose Dragon Archetype, as it can special summon itself uh, from the graveyard if it was sent to the... Uh, if, uh, not if a plant-type monster, including itself, was sent to the graveyard except during the damage step, and if a plant type monster is on the field and this card is in your graveyard, you can basically add it to your hand to basically ensure some of the uh, some of those plays in the first effect as well. So needless to say, you run two or three of these at all times. And now we have the um, Eyes Restrict and Relinquished archetype, who also got some new support in form of one card, the Golden Idol. So essentially, this is a retrain of the Thousand Eyes Idol and somewhat mitigates the need to run the titular th a Thousand Eyes Idol, the level 1 normal monster. So, yeah, it also provides additional equips for your Relinquished and Eyes Restrict monsters, only extra deck Eyes Restrict monsters, uh, obviously. And, yeah, it's, um, it's an ideal target, so, uh, so you can summon it with 1 for 1, and uh, the Archetype already has plenty of level 1 monsters in the Archetype uh, to speak of, so, yeah. Golden Idol is a definite 2-3 of staple in the archetype. 
And now we move on to Egyptian Gods, which actually got four cards worth of support, starting with Thunder Force Attack, which is a quick play spell you can activate only if you control Slifer the Sky Dragon. And it allows you to destroy as many face-up monsters your opponent controls as, as possible. And if you activate this thing during the main phase, you can draw cards equal to the, mon uh, to the number, amount of monsters you destroyed. But only one monster can attack this turn, which is most likely going to be Slifer since you've destroyed a hell of a lot, a lot of shit. And this card basically turns the Slifer into the one of the best, uh, one of the best God cards, if not the best God card. Well, who am I kidding? Slifer ha has been turned into the best God card with this and with another card, which we'll get uh, get to soon. But before that, we have to take a look at the Fist of Fate, which uh, allows you to negate the effects of one uh, one effect monster your opponent controls and then send it to the graveyard. And of course, effects cannot be activated in response to this thing's activation. And to top it all off, you get a Harpy's Feather Duster effect, which is nice if it wasn't for the horrible cost of controlling Obelisk the Tormentor in order to, con uh, to conduct this effect. Which make uh, which moves this card to from a uh, all right to uh, all right uh, to a fantastic card into a uh, ga ga somewhat garbage to win war card since Obelisk the Tormentor hasn't been seeing competitive play since mammoths were still walking the earth. So yeah, not worth it in my opinion. Although if you are building a deck centered around Obelisk the Tormentor for whatever reason. You can run this if you want, I'm not gonna stop you, so yeah. However, the real meat of this uh, uh, conversation is exchanging souls, which during your main phase allows you to immediately after this card resolves tribute a divine summon of a divine beast monster, any of them, and when you do, you can also tribute monsters your opponent controls even though you do not control them, and if you do, until the end of the next turn, after this card resolves, you can only activate one card or effect per turn, other than Divine Beast Monster's effects, and you can only activate one of these per turn. So essentially, this also uh, this can uh, basically help you to turbo out all of the guard cards by uh, using only your opponent most monsters, and because uh, Konami just loves cramming these anime references into their cards, this was supposed to reference the time uh, uh, Kaiba used the anime effect of Soul Exchange to tribute all of Ishizu's monsters to summon Obelisk the Tormentor. And let me just say right now, Obelisk the Tormentor isn't going to be the monster you're summoning with this effect. It's going to be Slifer the Sky Dragon because of the Thunder Force attack. Since basically you're, you're getting tr uh, tribute removal uh, for your opponent's monsters and you can get rid of uh, the other monsters with Thunder Force attack essentially... Uh, turning Slifer into a very legit beat stick, which can basically win games on its own. So yeah, the, this is a definite staple in dedicated uh, decks that either run Egyptian God cards as removal options or decks that are purely built around the Egyptian God cards. So yeah, run two or three of these. And now we move on to Dark Spell Regeneration, which is the, the single solitary wing Dragon of Raw support. Again, made to uh, made to make uh, anime references for no inexplicable reason by supporting the worst Egyptian god card, which is never going to see play despite all of these uh, lovely support cards it's getting. Because the internal uh, issues of Winged Dragon of Ra have still not been fixed, and basically giving its uh, and giving him hits anime effects through multiple cards worth of support is not the way to go about it unless you actively make a retrain out of the thing. So yeah, not recommended. And now we move on to Sacred Beast, which we only got one card, uh, one new card worth of support. That is Armitalo Chaos Phantasm Phantom of Fury, which is essentially the anime version of uh, Armitalo Chaos Phantom, the original one. And speaking of the original, you can actually special summon him with this thing's effect, which is a pretty neat bonus for how good this effect actually is and you can also summon it with the, their archetypal fusion spell which is always a plus in my book so yeah definitely recommend running this 
Penguins! Penguins got two new cards worth of support, first of which is Penguin Torpedo, and all I'm going to say is, if you crave an effect like this, just run freaking Borolo Dragon instead. But Penguin Heroes, a level 6 Synchro Monster, again out of nowhere, is actually a pretty nice card since it actually trigger, um, triggers the uh, flip effects of all phase down defense position uh, water monsters which are very uh, which are very few far in between but it does turn penguin soldier into one of the wor more versatile cards in the entire game which is which was honestly a long time coming if we know how much of an impact penguin soldier made on the meta especially during the necros format uh, and he could even screw over some Burning Abyss players back in the day, so... Yeah, Penguin Heroes is a testament to the Ping Penguin Soldier's legacy, how powerful it was, and my, he might start seeing some more play after this thing. So yeah, great card. Now we move on to Dark Worlds. Again, one, card, uh, one new card worth of support, and that is the Dark World Reinforcements. Monster Reborn triggers uh, the other Dark World effects, sets up the graveyard. What's not to like? Run 3. Archfiends, one new card worth of support, and that is the Archfiend Staff of Despair, the equip spell. Oh well, um, if you don't, if you have one high attack monster such as Five God Dragon, because that is the absolute highest based attack you can uh, get uh, onto the field, and then you equip uh, equip this thing onto it, you can basically watch your opponent scoop instantly because that's such an incredible. Attack, uh, attack reduction of all monsters on on your opponent's field that it's simply hilarious. So yeah, this thing ain't gonna see any plays uh, unless it's an, in a gimmick deck. So yeah, this thing is not an Archfiend card at all, but uh, I guess it's a nice gimmick card considering the theming. And now we move on to new Machinas, and the first of which is Machina Razor Break, which is... A fine little um, piece you can experiment with since it uh, provides a fairly chunky uh, 1200 attack boost until the end of the turn. And you uh, you can also add it to your hand upon my uh, Machina monster destroying something by battle, which is very admirable considering uh, how this effect is usually applied. And also Machina on Class Pair, which is, uh, which is another... Uh, Machina card and the final Machina card that got support. It's essentially an archetypal Breeze the Zephyr with, uh, with the ability to set up your graveyard by acting as the archetypal's foolish burial. So yeah, run two or three of these. And now we have the one, uh, the one Greffer support card, that being Chaos Greffer. Yeah, I never expected Greffers to get some additional support, but yeah, here we are, I guess. The Chaos Greffer is essentially Dark Greffer for both light and dark monsters, except they got rid of the summoning condition, which was the best thing about Dark Greffer, and one the reason why he actually saw plays in Infernities. But this is not bad by any means. In dedicated Chaos builds, this thing is a, a nice level 4 monster, which can basically set up a lot of your plays, so I definitely recommend running him in dedicated Chaos builds. Next up we have the Charmers, they actually got some new support as well, lots of cards of new support. First of which we start off with the Awakening Possessed lineup of monsters, first of which is Great Inari Fire. All of them are level 5 monsters with 200, uh, 2000 attack and 200 defense, and have the ability to special summon themselves from the deck, if you can believe it, by sending a face-up spellcaster monster and a monster of the appropriate attribute, that is uh, level 4 or lower. And, uh, and then you, they have the effect when they are special summoned and when they're sent from the field to the graveyard. The Great Inari Fire is great for some burn dedicated deck along with searching out spir spiritual fire art or the pieces of back row for uh, the archetype. All of them have this, the same floating effect uh, except they search out their respective attributes, uh, spiritual art and all of them also uh, search the possessed spell or trap cards. So let's move on with uh, with the rest of their monsters. The uh, an, a Reaper of Nefariousness is a, ni a nice tool for extenders and uh, um, basically uh, could be a staple for any Earth Spellcaster deck, which is almost non-existent, but something is certainly there. Uh, floating effect is the same. Ga Gagigo by uh, Gagio by Gai Gag. 
gigabytes. Sorry, this is um, this, this is such a tongue wrap I cannot put it into words. Uh, is nice for some hand disruption and uh, Rasenryu is a nice bouncer since of course it's a wind monster and wind monsters always have to have effect about bouncing so yeah I guess you can also use him in divine wind variants if you happen to have some room for him by any chance anyway masters of the spiritual arts is a nice uh, quick play spell which uh, basically acts as a search and a special summon from the deck which is always appreciated special summons in phase down defense position which charmers are all about so yeah definitely w would recommend running three of them and teamwork of the possessed is a uh, shallow grave for the archetype along with providing some neat recycling uh, on and placing the back row on directly onto the field so yeah, not worth as much as the previous card, but uh, it's definitely worth two or three, uh, uh, one or two uh, spots in the ex uh, in the main deck. So uh, that was it for the charmers, and now uh, we will move on to noble knights who got one new card worth of support, which is the infernoble knight general Olivier. It's a level five synchro monster, has the standard uh, fire uh, fire equip effects like all infernoble knights do. And it also uh, happens to be uh, so it, it also happens to have the potential to become a level five tuner monster, which is very uh, a very nice effect uh, for a card of this caliber since you can basically you can basically uh, enable noble knights to pull off some quasar builds if they put their uh, heart and soul into it. Although it won't it won't be. Uh, as consistent as the as the decks that were originally made to support Quasar builds, but hey, Noble Knights actually have an option right now since they have a level five tuner monster. So yeah, if you're aim aiming for a Quasar build, this is basically an essential tool for uh, for the archetype to use. Next up, we have also one card worth of support, but this time for the uh, Skull Servant archetype, and is the level one White Baking, which is absolutely fantastic it uh, it gives one of the strongest decks in existence an even stronger boost and the protection it offers is also uh, very admirable it becomes skull servant while in the graveyard to support the king of the skull servants even more so yeah what's not to like run three of these at all times and now we move on to the galaxy bro bunch of support first uh, and then that is only one card again and that is galaxy eye cypher x dragon this is the archetypes first level 10 monster if i am correct and it's very interesting as it works as a rank 9 uh, uh, fetch backer is that even a word yeah it fetches back rank 9 monsters which most relevant option here at th this precise moment is uh, the Cypher Blade Dragon, although if King of All Calamities was a Dragon type, then this thing would have seen the ban list very, very soon. So, yeah, it um, it works in an, with the intended nature of Cypher Blade Dragon, and let's just see how much of a play will it see if uh, Dark Matter Dragon actually comes off the ban list. So, yeah, also protects light monsters uh, from uh, being uh, from card effects, so, yeah. A neat plus in my book. And next up we move on to the Utopia bunch of cards. To be more precise, the Zexal weapon category actually got some additional support. And we'll start off with ZS Ascent Sage, which is basically your uh, first monster you bring out to bring out a Utopia monster. Same goes with Arm Sage, and both of them have excellent floating effects upon them being used as material. Uh, for an Xyz summon, Z Z Arm Sage allows you to add a, Z a Zexal weapon for, uh, to, from your deck to the hand, while Ascent Sage basically gives you a rank up magic, which directly plays into the gimmick of this new archetype. Uh, well, not new archetype, new archetype support, sorry. Uh, and that is making uh, making new Zexal weapon infused uh, Utopia monsters. One of the Zexal weapons you can search is Pegasus Twin Saber, which really hammers in, as well as the rest of the archetype, the point home about uh, your opponent's life points be being 2,000 higher than yours. Yeah, uh, the card that started this trend is Eagle Claw, and the this new support wave 
really drives that point home and continues going along with it. So, yeah, Twin Saber is really good. It allows it allows you to basically give give a Utopia monster 1,000 attack boost, which is uh, very admirable and very impressive. And when uh, and you can negate any monster effect activated on your opponent's field, which is basically uh, a huge deal nowadays due to the influx of uh, effects that activate during the battle phase. The monster effects that have uh, have other various protection effects or that can basically pop this uh, pop other monsters during the battle phase. So yeah, this thing is a nice card, although. It's my main problem is because it, uh, is that it's level five, which is not something I'm very comfortable with. So yeah, run by preference, I would say. And now we move on to their extra deck monsters. First of which we have Zexel Weapon Dragonic Halberd. Requires two level five monsters, and it provides some very nice field presence along with a very hefty three thousand attack boost on your Utopia monsters, which is not something to laugh at at all. And yeah, it's a um, it's def it's a definite staple in the deck and the main piece you need to equip to Dragonic Utopia Ray, which is a uh, rank five monsters requ requires three level five monsters or rank or rank up magic. You never know. And its name becomes uh, Chaos Number 39 Utopia Ray while it's on the field. So yeah, I rarely see a evolution which supports another evolution, but here we are. And it once per turn when this card is targeted for an attack or by a card effect, you can equip a Zexal weapon monster from your hand or deck to this card as if it was equipped by its own effect, which is uh, which is a very fantastic card since you actually can equip a Zexal weapon which has very costly equipping conditions such as Eagle Claw or Pegasus Twin Saber. So, yeah. Good, uh, good card in that regard. Also, you can detach a material from this card and target the face-up cards. Your opponent controls up to the number of Zexal weapon monster cards equipped to this card and negate their effects. I would have loved if you could actually destroy this, uh, destroy those cards, but this is more than enough for this thing's OTK range since Halberd, uh, Dragonic Halberd gives it a 3000 attack boost. Also, Twin Saber gives it a 1000 attack boost. So yeah, it essentially, this thing has the potential to rise into a 6500 beater, which is nothing to scoff at. Excellent choice in the Aura Utopia deck. Run, uh, uh, always run this in basically any Utopia deck that focuses on Zexal weapons. The new rank up magic they got is rank up magic Zexal Force, and it's very good. It allows you to special summon from your extra deck a Utopia or a Zexal weapon monster that is one rank higher than an Xyz monster you control. Any Xyz monster, mind you. And you, of course, use the monster as material. And it, you can place a Zexal weapon and a, Z Z a Zexal Sage monster from your deck to, on the top of your deck. Which is not something I understand why does it do that, but... I guess it works into the divination game. Yeah, I know, whatever. Anyway, if your opponent's life points are at least 2,000 higher than yours, of course, you can also banish this card from your graveyard to, for some neat drop power with of one card, which is also nice uh, considering the fact that this uh, if uh, that this does not need to be activated after uh, on the following turn after it was sent to the graveyard. So, yeah. De decent card and, def uh, and a definite staple rank up magic card. And Zexal in Trust is also um, uh, a nice card which allows you to revive your Utopia, Zexal Weapon and Zexal Sage monsters. And if your opponent's life points again uh, are 2000 higher than yours, uh, you can also banish this card from your graveyard. You have to wait a turn unfortunately and you can target a Zexal spell or trap in your graveyard and add it to your hand which is some neat recycling, so you can also run, run any number of these, which you, uh, how many you might need. Zexal Construction is basically uh, this deck's new way and new generation of generating cons consistency, so you basically get, uh, run three of these, and it, it can also surge uh, the rank down magic numeron fall unless you're planning on summoning uh, Utopia Roots, so yeah, that's a plus. And finally, Zexal Alliance is something 
uh, um, part of the, uh, this effect basically turns Utopias into their anime counterparts where they cannot be destroyed by, by another except with another number monster which is uh, very nice. It also is the second card in existence that lowers your life points to 10 other than of course be the Utopia the Prime, that, that being the first card that does that. And also allows you to special summon a Utopia monster from your graveyard and if you do place the one card from your deck to the top of your deck. Again, why why does this archetype have the top decking of uh, Zexal weapons? Uh, it, the only archetype that benefits from this are, it's not even archetype, but yeah, the the cards that work around the uh, rank up magic the seventh one and yeah this deck does not benefit from that uh, that rank up magic so i have no idea why they suddenly enforce this uh, top decking gimmick onto them but yeah i guess they'll drop it after the next wave or something hoping at least anyway we have our final two archetypes which received support. First of which we have L the Laval archetype which received w two new cards worth of support. First of which we have Laval Archer which is a level 4 fire monster with 1000 attack and 200 defense of course. And if it's normal summon during your main phase this turn you can uh, perform an additional normal summon which is beyond amazing for this archetype. And of course, if this card is, into you, in, is in your graveyard, you can target a fire monster you control and you cannot special summon monsters for the rest of this turn except fire monsters. And destroy the targeted monster and if you do special summon this card in defense position, but banish it when it uh, leaves the field. So yeah, this is okay-ish recovery, but nothing too amazing. But the double summon effect is definitely why this card will be uh, a definite staple in the Laval builds. But the worst thing about it is that you have to waste your normal summon in order to apply it because this thing specifically needs to be normal summoned in order for the effect to go off. So, yeah. Laval Archer is a neat card, but you'll only be using its uh, double summon effect consistently. And the other card they received is the level uh, 7 Synchro Monster, Laval Val Salamander. Which is something I would consider so close to mildly okay. Well, basically it allows you to draw two cards when it's Synchro Summoned, but you, then you have to send two cards from your hand to the graveyard, including at least one Fire Monster. And if you do not have any Fire Monsters in your hand, you have to reveal your entire hand and shuffle it into the deck. Wonderful. And, and, and you actually do not get... Uh, the cards and uh, the cards back by drawing the same number of them or anything so essentially this is a uh, allure of darkness for fire monsters in monster form yeah wonderful but still it's a uh, it's absolutely a great card it also sets up the laval graveyards for all their love uh, a lovely uh lavalli uh spell and trap cards to uh, to go with them and yeah it also puts rekindling to good use and of course, you can uh, you can for some reason has the, have for some reason has the effect to uh, change monsters to face down defense position, which I honestly don't know why the hell do they did they include this effect? Well, anyway, you primarily run this effect uh, run this card because of the draw effect, and that's pretty much it. It's your it's your most ideal first turn option with the uh, with the archetype. And now we move on to the last archetype, which received support. Fossils! Oh, oh boy! Oh, okay, Shell Knight, yeah, Shell Knight only had the 500 attack, uh, 500 burn damage effect uh, in the anime, and of course they had to add a bunch of shit because God, God, God help me, this archetype isn't going to see any meta relevance if, yeah, if you don't add uh, any uh, out of place effects like this, but yeah, at least I can. Uh, I can compliment it for sticking to the rock theme and uh, and the theme of the archetype and it's, a sh it's such a shame about the block dragon being banned because that was one of the cards that basically ensured uh, the, sa the safe usage of this archetype without you getting OTK'd in like uh, 3 turns or even 2. So yeah, Shell Knight is alright but the archetype needs a complete overhaul in order to be uh, somewhat functional and now we move on to their last three monsters which are fusion monsters the last bit of fusion monsters which were missing from the anime the skull machine lineup skull machine skull buggy uh well crappy stats horrible effect and it's outclassed by its uh level six variant skull wagon which did not even have an effect in the anime well 
uh, or at least I think. Yeah, no, actually none of these actually had the eff had their effects in the anime, and it's kind of disappointing that this is the most basic shit they could have come up with for cards which didn't even have the effects. Blizzard Wolf from the Glacial Beast archetype was better than this, goddammit. Anyway, this card can attack twice, not that it really matters since his attack is 300 stronger than Skull Buggy and he's uh, more difficult to summon. So yeah, not worth it. And of course the burn damage because, yeah, the burn damage is kind of sizable but it's not worth it. Now the best card among all these is Skull Convoy and it's actually, I would dare call it the best fossil card in the existence because in, in the entire archetype because it requires a rock monster and a level 7 or higher monster, yeah, again, these summoning conditions are truly atrocious. And it must first be special summoned with Fossil Fusion and while you control the Fusion Summon card, all monsters your opponent controls lose attack equal to their own original offense. Yeah, that, that effect is about as relevant as uh, Stratos getting banned 5 to 6 years ago. And this card can make up to 3 attacks on monsters during each battle phase and when this card destroys an opponent's monster by battle you can inflict 1000 damage to your opponent. So yeah, not only it, does he have the ability to attack 3 monsters during each battle phase, but it also burns 1000 upon and destroying uh, something by battle each time, although the stats I wish they were a bit better. There isn't much in the ter in terms of boosting this archetype's uh, stats f uh, for beyond what they already are in their in their base form so yeah you don't have to rely on some generic uh, stuff in order to uh, get the most relevance out of these but I absolutely see uh, a deck being built around this thing and like moon mirror shield so it can basically run over everything and anything uh, with ease so yeah combined with so basically that's uh, 3300 damage each turn if it destroys three monsters each turn so yeah fossils were handled somewhat somewhat okayishly considering uh, what the su what this support wave consisted of so yeah if they'll receive more cards I absolutely have no idea but let's just hope they actually gain some nice advantage as opposed to clinging to the anime references and anime effects or trying to modernize said anime effects as much as they can because uh, that that wasn't uh, competitive at all back in the day, let alone now. It, it really smells like an old archetype uh, from the GX era, so yeah, if you can somehow remove that those nostalgia goggles or whatever they are and actually remake some of these archetypes from the ground up for example fossils uh, I would have I would have really li liked to see that so let's just uh, wait and see if they actually su succeed in doing that and let's for the love of god hope that I get to talk about new fortune ladies in the, in the next one. I am still waiting for some new support for that archetype because they really feel like they, they are just one good support wave away from being a competitive meta deck and yeah they they are severely lacking in the extra deck monster department um, I would have also pro I would also prefer a uh, tuner with an inherit special summoning condition in fact any monster with an inherit special summoning condition would be nice spell and trap support is okay the way it is but yeah uh, I would definitely definitely prioritize making new extra deck monsters because that's honestly something they really need so yeah Konami if you're listening I want to talk about fortune ladies and the new support uh, in the new support wave and the archetype rematch so yeah get on that shit as for now, I uh, thank you all so much for watching. Stay tuned for more videos, videos and updates. Comment, like, and subscribe. Next time we'll be returning to our, uh, to our regular archetype analysis videos. And be sure to check out my Patreon when you got the time. Maybe drop a few donations if you feel like it. And as usual, I'll pull the next vid whenever I can. See you all and have a good day. Peace.